So, can we start, uh, can you say and spell your name and give us your title here? Mm -hmm. I'm Leah Wong Ashburn, and uh, it's not hyphenated, just kind of, I use three names, so it's <laughs> L-E-A-H, W-O-N-G, A-S-H, B-U-R-N, and I'm the president and CEO of Highland Brewing Company in Asheville, North Carolina. Wonderful. Well, today is uh, June 29th, and uh, we are at Highland in Asheville, North Carolina, doing an interview for the Well-Crafted NC Project. So, Leah, can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Where, where are you from, and what's your path towards Highland? I had a circuitous path, <laughs> so I've kind of been all over the place. Um, born in California, raised in New Jersey till I was 15. Then my family came down to North Carolina, actually to Charlotte. And I just got to Asheville in about 2012. Um, started working for Highland in 2011. And I had a, a prior career, you know, the post-college jobs that sort of, sort of meander around places and don't really go anywhere. And, uh, but it really, it did lead me to a great job in sort of uh, marketing, design, communications. And that parlayed into an educational sales job that was great for me that I did for, I think, 13 years. Uh, working with students and teachers and it was wonderful. I actually used my journalism degree, which was really hard to do at the time. Um, and then my dad really had, he and I had a 16 year conversation about me coming to the brewery. So I asked for a job at, at 24 when the brewery is new. He said no. He offered me that job eight years later. I said no. And eight years after that is when it was the right time for the brewery, for my family and for us indiv individually. Yeah. So we'll talk about Highland just for a little bit. Can you give us a little bit about the early history of Highland before you came on? There, yeah, and there's a lot of history <laughs> before I got here. So I, um, I'm very uh, conscious of that and of all the folks that, that made great things happen. Um, so yeah, in 1994, there were no breweries in Asheville. Um, the permitting was a really confusing process. Nobody really knew what to do, how to approve it. Um, so dad had partnered up with an experienced and award-winning brewer from Charlotte and um, they decided that they would work together do this great thing dad had more of the the capital and the business experience and this guy is really an artist and he was a great brewer so uh, dad said I'm not interested in doing this in Charlotte even though that's where they both lived at the time he said but you know my family and I have fallen in love with Asheville if you're interested in moving there we can do this so they found a basement in downtown Asheville, there was not a lot going on in downtown Asheville at the time. You know, a restaurant, I can think of one, um, a great shoe store, <laughs> still there, uh, you know, very little. And so dad really took this huge step because he saw the potential in Asheville and the culture that was here and the deeply embedded um, ties to craft and independence and those things beautifully tie in to craft beer, um, quality of life. It was, it was a great kind of future that he saw, which he doesn't even admit, but I really think he saw those things. <laughs> he, he admits he lucked out. Is that, is that his? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you talked a little bit about your, your background in educational sales um, prior to coming here. Do you see tie-ins between the work you did there, benefits from having had that work? in what you're doing here today? I do in that, in that I was doing something that I loved and so I continue doing those things like sticking my nose in marketing. And <laughs> I love those things and, and I did sales for a long time. The sales that we do now is so much more sophisticated than what I did and, and how I did it for Highland for over for just a year and a half mm -hmm. how I started at the company. Um, but I do think that the experience is always great and, and you're learning things all the time that are really about the most important things and that's people and relationships and working with different types of people and so that always is helpful um, and going through your own successes and your own failures along the way really really valuable I know that's what dad was kind of watching me do in my prior career because I was an independent contractor so you really have those right. successes and failures that you you just have to own them all and um, and that was a great a great time for me I think I did bring over a lot of things here that um, I still enjoy doing and brought a, a different set of skills from what my father had established right so kind of tying into that when you when you first became president 
Um, what year was that? 2015. 2015. Um, were there changes that you made in the business to kind of better reflect your vision or your kind of ideas for the brewery? Uh, yes. So the, the biggest change that I've done, which is recent, and I say I, but our, our whole team did with help from <laughs> third parties, um, is change the brand. And it was a, a radical change. It was something that we started hearing inklings about from, uh, from our own team, from other industry friends, from our distributor partners. It's kind of all over the place. And, um, and that kind of grew and it caused us to do real research to see if we could back up what we were hearing. And, and we did, and, and part of that research was with our own team, me surveying everybody here, and that's beautiful alignment in kind of who we really were, mm -hmm. and then we focused on showing that with our brand. I think we've done that. So that's just, that's one piece. Um, you know, dad's really unusual. The entrepreneur, the first generation, normally ex would be expected to hang on really tightly to a company that they have given birth to and nursed for so long and developed and created their own image of this thing that just didn't exist before. My father is this hands-off, make it yours since the day I walked in. And I'm so fortunate for that. I'm really grateful to him, even though sometimes it's terrifying for him to be like, do whatever you want, you'll figure it out. I did get to figure it out, you know, me and then, and then working with my own team that's been here. Um, and I think that that is rare and really special. So um, over time, like I, I now have, it took years, but I now have more comfort in, in feeling like, okay, Highland can represent me and I don't have to be dad and I can't. I would do a terrible job of that trying. So it's been fun to kind of get comfortable in that space and then see what I can bring from that comfort. Right. Um, so as you kind of moved into the position, and even still today, are there specific resources that you draw on to kind of build your skills as a leader here? You know, um, yes, there's building my skills as a leader here has, has, we started with hiring a VP who had so much, has so much industry experience from working at a distributor, from, you know, delivering from trucks up to leading that distributor and leading other distributors so he uh, and leading a wine company so mm. that as kind of my partner here from the beginning was so valuable and still is and my husband is here we roped him into working twice as much for half the pay and he is an engineer and a general contractor and he built this beautiful deck that we're sitting on right now so it's been wonderful to have his support um, both both mentally um, and physically with his efforts that he's contributing. Right. How's that sound doing for you? Is that going to be okay? It's fine. Cool. It's fine. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you've been here for a few years now, but, you know, you probably still had a look at the local brewing scene before that, having kind of grown up in a family that mm -hmm. was involved in the industry. Can you talk a little bit about the changes both in the local brewing scene, but also kind of how the local brewing scene has affected Asheville. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a two-part question. Yeah, uh, so it's changed. I mean, radical doesn't even begin <laughs> to describe from being um, the, the pioneers in town and, um, and then seeing it grow into a handful. And then now there are 30 some odd in Asheville alone. Um, and then you go to Western North Carolina. In North Carolina today, I think we're at about 170. So it's just been an explosion of growth. And there's been a couple of effects to that um, on us. And I'm, I'm actually, there's, those effects can be positive. So more people are coming to Asheville. That's great for everybody. It's beer is actually a top five reason for people to come to the city now. That's amazing. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And also with smaller breweries opening up, with some of the largest breweries in the country building in or near Asheville, it's really made us define who we are more clearly, to look at ourselves more closely, and to be better at what we do. Yeah, and to, to kind of go off of that, how do you define the main mission of Highland? Kind I of wanna the be the pride of the Southeast. We are, we're born and bred in Asheville. 100% um, of our effort is, is you know, in this one location, which I love. 
um, but we're really distributed. We're distributed in seven southeastern states, and um, and we're there's a reason for that. We're Highland, you know, to honor the Scots Irish history in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. So that's kind of where we distribute our beer, that that corner of the U.S. And um, and I I love that we have a reason for being where we are, and um, so so kind of sharing that story with folks and sharing my dad's American dream story. He's an immigrant, uh, he's Chinese, but was born and raised in Jamaica. He came to the U.S. to get an education, started an engineering business as a second fun career hobby retirement gone horribly wrong. He starts a brewery and this thing is bigger than he ever imagined. And um, he's thrilled that I'm here and I'm thrilled that he's here. So we're, we're in this really wonderful story that that continues to evolve um, and, and part of a bigger community that has done a great thing for Asheville which to this day doesn't have a ton of industry and it celebrates beer and independent beer and owning its breweries and that people come here and enjoy it we love that the, the city is very proud of that and and then as a state, North Carolina is one of the top in the country for beer production and visitation. So it's, it's really been a wonderful thing, um, an industry that's grown a lot. Even in 2008, during that crash, I mean, craft beer at great numbers. There was something to celebrate at that time. And I'm proud to be part of that. Right. Um, so over the years, Highland has supported a number of local community and advocacy related groups, um, particularly those focused on environmental issues. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of the brewery in supporting these types of community initiatives and these types of partnerships? Yeah, um, the brewery's always been involved, and that was that was something my dad established early on. Community service is part of his life, and so it's part of any company of, of which he gives his time. And um, so one of our earlier partnerships that I'm aware of is with the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy, and um, so they protect land in perpetuity. And so that permanence just speaks volumes to me. And so that's the, you know, the land and the landscape that we're enjoying up here. And it's the water resources, the water we use for brewing. Um, so if I can contribute to permanently protecting those things that brought my family here, that people move here to enjoy, it's really just, you know, it's part of the lifestyle here, then, then we're protecting something for everybody else in the, in the future. And that, that feels great to me. Um, but we donate all, you know, it could be time, service on boards, um, it can be money, it can be beer, and we are, we're constantly involved and, and really try to focus in four different areas of our giving. So um, that's been really cool to kind of uh, align our values to, to where we give. And there are a lot of great places to give in Asheville. Did you know there are more nonprofits here per capita than anywhere else in the country? Oh. It's just crazy, like, so all these good people live here that want to do good things. And, and that's part of the draw. That's, I, it's part of the magic of this town. Um, but anyway, so we had to focus on areas because there are so many good things to do. And, uh, and that's been a cool thing. Um, people in need, natural and cultural resources, uh, health and wellness, and animals in need. It's not a bad quartet of areas to support. It's cool. That covers a lot of areas too. That's that's really awesome. Well, one of the things we were talking about before we started filming was um, the solar panels that we saw in some of the kind of physical plant sustainability efforts that you guys have gone through uh, and put in. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I would love to. Yeah, so we're sitting on this roof and we have the view of our solar array. We have 1,045 solar panels. And in, I think, 2016 or 2015, we found out that this, this, this solar array at our little brewery is actually the third largest of any craft brewer in the country. And we're not anywhere close to the third largest firm in the country. So we have this completely outsized solar array. And it's, it was the 13th largest of any brewery in the world wow. at that time. So I, I'm thrilled by that. We didn't do it on purpose. Um, but, it, you know, on a sunny day, we can create more power than we can use. And that's really exciting to me. Um, and any power that we don't use is going back on the grid to help offset other use of, of coal. And so it's, it's a great thing. Um, but it doesn't stop there. There are so many things that we that we try to do on an ongoing basis. Um, between having LED and motion sensitive lights wherever we can have them in the brewery, we've swapped them all out. Um, we have used um, timber that we that we had to harvest 
didn't have to harvest, but you know, we're doing some expansion around here. If we take down a tree, we want to use that tree. So our bar tops in the event center are made from trees harvested from the property. Um, you know, using double walled glass that keeps more heat out or you know, temperature changes minimized. Um, that's really important to us. And so we, we're constantly looking at ways, uh, working with um, the power company to, there's, there's a program they have, they can kind of turn off utilities during peak times to reduce peak need. And that's, that doesn't help us, but it's something we can do. So we have this little monitor in there that does that for us, and that helps kind of reduce peak usage in the whole area. That's very cool. So can you talk a little bit about the size of Highland today, uh, both in terms of capacity, production capacity, and people? Yeah, so um, we're, we're a lot bigger than we ever anticipated, and we're growing, which is fantastic. We're at about 50 full-time people, um, a dozen or two part-time folks, and um, we're at about 43,000 barrels annually. Um, and that puts us you know, easily within the top 100 of craft brewers in the country. We're really excited about that. Um, and, and I, but my goal is not to be the biggest. I don't have a desire to send beer across the country. Um, I really like being where we are and being important here. And we're really fortunate that people come from all over the place to North Carolina and to Asheville specifically. So I just want them to come here. <laughs> it's not a bad place to come. Um, so. You, you mentioned kind of growth that you didn't anticipate at the beginning and, and continued growth uh, over the last few years. But in terms of, you know, not just production and people, the physical space has grown tremendously. Can you talk a little bit about some of the changes that you guys have implemented, the reasoning behind them, but also kind of maybe describe them a little sure. bit for the camera? Yeah, this is, um, so we're on a 40 acre site right now and this building is about twice the size of the size of the brewery so there are other tenants in the building that means though that we've got plenty of room to grow over time and with this 40 acres we're going to cut trails this summer on our property so exciting to me there's a stream here that no one gets to see and um, you know just enjoying walking through the woods as part of where I spend my work days is that's that is the reflection of me that we were talking about earlier, like making this place somewhere that, that I enjoy being that offers the life balance that's really important to me. Um, so I can't wait to add that. But, but the history of the property is really interesting. It was, it was a forgotten building. It had just fallen into such disrepair. And so when my father decided that he was gonna rent at the time, rent part of this building, I thought he had lost his mind. The, the roof is leaking everywhere. There were trees growing out of the floor. There was mold, there's asbestos. I mean, you name it, we had it. And it was just nuts. So piece by piece, we have been rehabilitating this old building and this old property. Um, it's, it's been through a lot and it's wonderful to take something that was forgotten and, and, and have you know, people be part of seeing what we're doing here because it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So um, it's, it's really been an interesting project. There have been some really weird things that we found in the building from old movie sets, fake dynamite, you know, rotating saw blades, just crazy stuff. So like, what an adventure for us to take this building. Um, the meadow is an old softball field for the companies that were here decades ago. And, um, and so we started with the production area. I and mean, we had to make beer and we were set up as a distributing brewery started there a couple people started showing up so we set up a tap box kind of next to the tanks and then more people started coming and then they started bringing their dogs and they were too close to the grain bags and the tanks and that was uncomfortable so we let them outside and then that got really crowded so so we opened up the meadow and it was just kind of a pile of dirt at the time and we didn't have bathrooms or a place to serve beer so we just packed it together for a little while and that, de that developed and really at the request of the staff and to their credit because the industry was changing and they said you know people really want to see us they want to come here see how the brewery operates who are the people behind it what does it smell like what does it look like and so we opened up the tasting room dad never envisioned that we'd be in the hospitality business and it's so important to us and I love 
that people want to come here. So let's give them a great experience. So that's been an iterative pro process of opening the tasting room and, you know, it, functional, function before form. That's how it works with family owned companies. So you get it working and you just keep working on it. Um, so it's been fun to do that, build the deck. Um, the packaging hall was our more recent production upgrade, took a terrible room and now it's beautiful just it just shines and has you know our, our best equipment in there um, the team takes care of it beautifully and we sort of built at the same time an event center and a rooftop bar that we're sitting on right now and that was really to house private events we couldn't accommodate all the private event requests that we were getting and we didn't want to close down the tasting room because people would inevitably show up and be disappointed that we were closed so we could say yes now to guests that are just showing up out of nowhere and to you know, the wedding party that wants to come and celebrate. So um, that's what's happening this evening. Actually a huge wedding rehearsal here tonight. And we're delighted to be able to have that experience of, of Highland expand and be part of people's personal celebrations. That's, my father has always been a celebrator. <laughs> so this is such a natural extension of him. And, and the way that we built the event center once you go up to the mezzanine, there's huge glass windows that you can see right into the production area. So you're kind of on the same level as the depalletizer. And you can see the bottles moving through all the production area. So it's a great way to be in touch with kind of what's really going on here. It's good old manufacturing mm -hmm. um, right when you're celebrating like the most special time of a couple's life. So it's yeah. really cool. Well, and that kind of plays on something that I think you mentioned a minute ago, and it's a thing that we've kind of heard from other folks too, where it's a growing interest by consumers, but also the industry in highlighting the people. So, you know, still focusing on the beer, but also now people who are drinking the beer want to know more about the people that are going they on. They do, and I, I'm so glad for that. Um, it, it, you know, it's the people that make everything work and so, um, and our staff shows up at the bar after work every day. So guests that come here, I can usually point out, yep, there's, you know, 10 or 15 people drinking free, you know, <laughs> and, but it's a delightful thing to me to know that they put in a day's work and they still are willing to hang out here together and enjoy our beer together. Yeah. It's, it's the greatest thing, but yeah, love having people here. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this a minute ago, you mentioned the rebranding. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess both a physical description of the rebranding, since we're doing this as a video interview, what, what, what you, what, how you would describe... Physical display, right <laughs> here, how's that? Uh, it, I, yes, and uh, kind of what drove the change? You talked a little bit about yeah. the conversation. We, yeah, we kind of started hearing voices. It was like hearing voices in your head almost, coming from different directions. Um, and then that was followed by the real research, and that was, that was so enlightening, it was so important to do that piece. So. So we looked at, I'll tell you about the research first, and then maybe go into what we looked like and what we look like now. Yes. And you'll know the why behind that. So um, the research was, was in three critical pieces. Um, the biggest piece was a Nielsen study. You know, the TV, big time, he never thought we could be part of something like that. So that was amazing to have thousands of people take part in a study that don't really know us and see what their first impressions were. And it was pretty clear that they were confused. They thought we should be making Scottish beer which was a great point because we looked very Scottish and they, some of them even thought that we were an import. And I thought, no, we're an American success story. And so, so we had to straighten that out. Um, and then another group that we talked to is kind of our fans, whether through social media, the newsletter, um, people that come here. And we asked all of them, like, fill out a survey about our packaging. And it was amazing to me because change is hard, right? It's natural to resist change, it's uncomfortable. 73% of people that like us told us that our packaging was outdated and or needed to change. That was a huge number. I thought, I, I thought we might see 15%, 73. So that's almost three quarters of the people that like us. So huge statement there. We had to listen to that, we had to respond. And then the third group closest to my heart was our own staff. And I sent out just, I mean, Sometimes the quickest surveys, those are the ones that people will respond to, right? So I wanted to get everybody, and I said, what three words come to mind when I say Highland? And our own team came back with, with concepts that I could kind of collect together and put in categories. And it was fascinating because that data matched 
what we learned from our branding company, which was pulling together all of the surveys that we had done. And it really said these, these wonderful things about quality, community, sustainability, family ownership, all of these wonderful things. And so we really focused on pioneering, being the first brewery in Asheville and continuing to do great things. So that became our focus. And uh, we were, were not actually Scottish. Our name carries on that heritage and that is, I would never change the name. I love it, it's perfect. We're on high land physically right now. The history of the Scots-Irish but since we don't make Scottish beer, I couldn't justify having a Scottish brand. So the name continues and then the look had to really reflect who we are and who we are in this day and age is very different from who, how we started in 1994. So the pioneering spirit comes through. So we, we developed this, this simplified compass. So that kind of gets the pioneering spirit across and this kind of artistic H in the middle um, that really spoke to me. I wanted a powerful H and I didn't know what that was going to look like, but that's something that came with a few iterations. So I was finally really happy with this and calling out Asheville because we're proud to be here and calling out 1994 because it's been a long time <laughs> and we're proud of that too. So that's how we got to our new logo um, and we changed everything that we did and it was super expensive and exhausting and terrifying to make that big of a change and it was worth every bit of it. Yeah, it's a lovely logo. Thank I you. I really like it. Thank you. I'm thrilled with it. So, you know, you've got the new space, you've got the new branding. Where do you see the company going in the next five to ten years? Or where would you like it to go, I guess would be a better way to right. phrase that. <laughs> so, um, I, would, I would like it to, again, be the pride of the Southeast. And to me, that can mean we, we've barely scratched the surface on this destination. Forty acres, huge building. A lot of frontage that you just kind of drive by and you sort of avert your eyes right now. It's not pretty, but it could be pretty. So over five to ten years, you know, we could we could have complementary businesses up here. You know, how would that look? And who would we want to be neighbors with? And who would be excited to be here and could contribute to um, to being authentic, um, to being you know true to Asheville, to being close to craft and independence, like all of those great things. And I think that they're really exciting directions that we can go with our destination. And because I believe in this destination so much, I think that you know, drawing people here for a great experience and then having them hopefully retell that experience and buy our beer in the, in the states where we distribute. Yeah. And I guess we, I mean, we've kind of tap danced around this a little bit, but uh, we've talked about the, the physical space, but not the location. How, can you describe, just for the folks who might not know, uh, where Highland, where the location is compared to and downtown where everything started? Yeah, um, which is you know one of our biggest blessings and also one of our biggest challenges. So um, Highland Brewing Company is about five minutes from downtown Asheville. And we started in downtown, but there's not enough space for us there. So we had to move. And when was that move? That was in 20... 2005. Okay. Might be 2000. That sounds about right. <laughs> it was 2005. Um, from the basement, which we outgrew long before we left it. I mean, it was, it was just crammed in there to this cavernous space. And that, that was a huge thing. Um, so, so we're a few minutes outside of downtown and 10 million people come to Asheville every year. I just need them to come five minutes outside downtown this beautiful hilltop so so giving them great things to do great great beer to have and also a great experience outside inside um, whether there are other businesses here someday I think that there's a lot of potential and that's mm -hmm. exciting and there are you mentioned there are kind of businesses that are out here with you now is it um, primarily distilling companies that's what it looked like driving in I wasn't no. quite sure um, so just the one and um, and then there are other just random assortment oh, okay. of companies yeah very cool doing all kinds of things very cool. So, um, what what would you say is your favorite part of working kind of in the industry here in Asheville or in North Carolina? I have had a wonderful experience um, getting to meet and work with people that I never would have otherwise, and um, and that's really across industries. 
One of the most exciting stories that I've had experiences is uh, I'm a Greenways fanatic. Anywhere I travel, I look for Greenways. I try to experience them. I just think it's one of the greatest things that that a municipality can offer to citizens. And um, in Asheville, as outdoorsy as we are, we're a very small city. And so we don't have as developed a system as we could. I'd like to help develop that. So we've raised money for, um, for Greenways through a couple different organizations. And, and that, that effort, like I was focusing on the East Asheville Greenway. That's, that's where, I, where Highland is, but it's also where it's very highly residential, connected to very highly commercial, but not connected by anything you can get to on foot safely. So whether it's getting people to jobs, keeping people healthier, like there's a lot of reasons to have that connectivity. And so we were raising money for um, the specific East Asheville Greenway. And I got to work with somebody at the city because I guess I was talking about it a lot. And she was like, I can help you understand how this process works a little bit. And she's delightful. So I got to learn about that. And then, and then we're raising money and then we talk to other people. And then it turned into, uh, we raised enough money for the feasibility study. It was like, yes, landmark. And we got to share that with the people that run our race that raises money for this effort. And then that somehow the city council took notice of the effort and, conver and conversation around this. And between them and the mayor, they put together a bond package and included the East Asheville Greenway on it. And the voters passed it. And so all of a sudden we have a plan and funding to build a multi-million dollar greenway in this little city in what is now gonna be, I believe five years, it was seven years at the time. I didn't know that could happen. I was just trying to do a good thing that I knew would take a really long time. And, and it is this amazing, I mean, I literally danced in the brewery. I was so happy when I found this out. And, and so many people made it happen and listened. And so that's really the exciting thing is this is a brewery and so much more. And we can bring people together around things here like I never even imagined. <laughs> That's that's amazing. That's I, one of the things that always um, makes me happy about honestly the industry is so many people seem committed to making their areas, their neighborhoods, their towns a better place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions, you know, our focus this summer with some of our interviews is talking to women leaders and brewers in the industry. Um, you know, one of the questions that we, we like to, to ask folks, the, the women that we're talking to, is kind of to reflect on being a woman in the industry. Uh, challenges, benefits, things, things that you feel may be unique to you as a woman leading a brewery the size of Highland. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's unique in so many ways to, to lead the brewery and um, I feel fortunate um, once in a while, I've been sort of verbally patted on the head by a man who has been in the industry for decades, once in a while. Um, but I can live with that because I think the, the benefit and the overall welcoming nature of the coolness of people that are in this industry far outweighs like the few instances where I've been like, okay, he doesn't get it. <laughs> so it's, it's few and far between. So. I'm, I feel really fortunate and you know, it's kind of, I think standing out is a great thing. So if I'm one of few women in the room, like I take that as, as a, as a benefit and, um, and people are really kind to, in, in this industry. So, um, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of golf. Sometimes I don't play golf. Um, so I feel like we should all be able to go shopping or get our nails done or go get a massage and have that paid for. I haven't done it yet. Um, but it's real tempting, so it may happen at some point, and I expect full support from the industry. <laughs> I, I will happily come. Um, <laughs> You're invited. <laughs> so, um, if if we if if you had a, a young woman fresh out of college who's looking to enter the industry, mm -hmm. what type of advice would you give her? Oh, just uh, go for it first of all, and don't be afraid to go for any position in which you have interest. So, uh, whether it's whether it's you know, more traditional roles are going to be probably in marketing. Our entire quality department is women. All three of them are women. We have a female brewer. 
our uh, key accounts manager is a woman. Um, we have lots of women in key positions here, and so just just go for it. And I, I've I've really enjoyed learning from people. Um, I haven't selected women or selected men intentionally, but you know everybody has something potentially that I can learn from. And so um, picking up from everyone is, has been really beneficial to me. Um, finding role models and close friends with whom you can share without any worry, you know, just share it all, get it all out there. That's really important too. So finding a smaller network, that's probably going to be women. Um, but I do have a couple of really special friends who happen to be men and, um, and they're business leaders and sharing with them um, on a really personal level. We, we have a very high level of trust. So trust trumps whether it's male, female relationships, and that's, that's critical. So kind of playing off of the networking that you m just mentioned, you've been heavily involved with the North Carolina Craft Brewers Guild. Can you talk a little bit about your work with that group and why you feel that involvement with a group like that is important? Um, yeah, my involvement with the, with the guild was, was I think a, a four year stint on the board and I was so new to Highland when I was elected to the board that I was like, oh crap, what am I supposed to know and what am I supposed to do? So it was such a growth period for me and I was so fortunate to serve on the board at the same time of some really, really bright people that you've met in your travels. Um, Sean at Full Steam is one of them. Um, Eric at Mystery and Todd at Noda, um, you know, now Jamie at Foothills. And so just wonderful, really smart people um, that I enjoyed being around. So um, it was it was great to get kind of a picture of where the state was, is, um, how we could grow together. And indeed, we were one of the five leading states in craft beer growth. It was two years ago, I believe, at the Craft Brewers Conference, and they showed this map and I and all you know top five states for craft brewing growth and they were all on the west coast and then bam right over here in north carolina it's like wow so that was like such an affirming thing to see um so so making great beer is important and, and, and we want everybody to make great beer and then people come from all over everywhere else to come see what we're doing that's that's a great compliment and it's, and it's a celebration. You know, back, beer is a celebration, gathering people together. So gathering people over the best quality beer that we can make um, and kind of gathering together to, to share resources and learnings because man, we all screw up. It is, and it's from the smallest brewery to the largest, it can be really amazing to see what similarities we have and things that can go wrong. And so it's, it's fantastic to have our folks you know that have similar jobs talking to people in different size breweries and we all learn from each other and all just kind of go like god I can't believe that happened and somebody else at a larger brewery be like we just did the same thing it's okay you live through it <laughs> so um but you know all in the name of making a better product and using the best resources yeah well, let's talk about the product a little bit can you talk a little bit about um highlands flagship beer but also some of the others um you know I think some of your beers have been around in some way, shape, or form for quite a while. For a very long time. <laughs> it's, I'm really proud of that, too. So we have a beautiful mix. But, it, but I'll start at the beginning, which was Gaelic Ale. And Gaelic Ale, I've had obscene amounts of that beer. And I still order that beer. If I have food, that is the beer I order. And I, I, I should love my beer. I do love my beer. And, and I don't make it. So my life is in the hands of really talented people from sourcing the right ingredients to brewing to packaging to distribution there to quality you know they they all make that happen and um and i'm honored by the work that they do some of the recipes have been around for 25 years almost now and some of them are brand new that we're developing we haven't you know we're developing things all the time and we really went through a renaissance around like kind of a bit prior actually to the brand refresh because we wanted to lead with beer. We did that the right way, and a marketing company would be horrified by that, I'm sure. They would say, you've got to do it at the same time. We're a brewery, we wanted to, we've been doing the same thing for a while, to be honest. And so, kind of freshening up what we did so that we were inspired by what we were doing first, and then seeing that spread to our distributors, our retailers, the people that love our beer, 
and more people would love our beer, hopefully. So we started changing things up and um, and really got into, you know, upped our IPA game. We had made one English style IPA for a very long time. It was an excellent example of that, but America didn't fall in love with English IPAs. It fell in love with its own style. And so we wanted to do that beautifully and we hired the right people to help us do that. Our brewmaster really helped us turn a corner on that source the right hops we went on a hop trip together it was amazing and and we really you know came up with several recipes over time we've we've tweaked one that we started with but seeing that evolution here has been so exciting and now we have a balance of you know the established and tried and true and wonderful go-to beers and the inventive ones that are newer for us that really get into a different game and this whole new we've got programs cooking right now that we haven't released to the public yet because it's so important to us to do it beautifully before we do it for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it for ourselves and get it right. So there's all kinds of excitement internally right now about things that are coming. Yeah. One of the, can you talk about maybe an example of one of the newer ones that you have released? Yeah. Um, so I'd love to talk about AVL IPA and, um, which is our airport code, so it's a great thing. I hope that they'll carry the beer forever. That would make sense. Um, but it's this beautiful IPA, this aromatic that finishes gently. Um, I, I, the finish on our beers has come along recently in ways that I'm, I'm just so proud of. And so I think we've just got this, you know, American, the West style, West Coast inspired, but American and, you know, East Coast tweaked. So, um, really proud of that beer it's doing beautifully for us and you know all the new packaging that has come out that's that's part of the excitement here too um, yeah. you're seeing gaelic in a different bottle is super weird for us we've seen it the most and um but seeing that kind of family of things together and how they look on a shelf like we're we're really proud of that yeah um so this past year you were named a semi-finalist for the james beard award oh my god standing line beer spirits professional can you talk a little bit? How did that feel? That had to be <laughs> insanely amazing. Yeah, can I talk about how shocking that was? <laughs> that came out of the total blue. Um, Sean Wilson at Full Steam sent me a cryptic text that said, if you don't know already, some good news is headed your way. And I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. So I called him and he told me what it was and I kind of couldn't believe it. So I had to get on Twitter myself, which I don't do and saw the announcement i it's amazing it's just it's it's amazing and it speaks to really what everybody else has done at highland with with making beer getting out the door having it look beautiful having it taste beautiful um and the recent like that that renaissance that we've had in recent years you know we we are a reflection of ourselves more now and now we're we've caught up to like developing that and developing our beer at the same time. Mm -hmm. So super exciting. I, I could not be more excited about the James Beard nomination. I felt like I won, even though it was just kind of the first round, um, but just really wonderful, exciting and honor. And I looked at the rest of the list. I was like, wow, all these people are like legit that are on this list. So just delighted. And I will put my little certificate on the wall as soon as possible. Um, it's awesome. Well, I think it says a lot about North Carolina too, because we had Sean was on the list as well. Yes, uh, yes. so two beer, wine, spirits professionals, and then other people from North Carolina. There were other chefs in Asheville and in North Carolina. So North Carolina showed out. It yeah. was terrific. Yeah. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about your favorite beer from here. Do you go classic with the Gaelic, or uh, do you have another favorite? Or can you choose a favorite? So yeah, I'm completely mood-based. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that. Um, again, when, I, when I'm eating food, Gaelic is my go-to, absolutely. And then, um, you know, it's, it's so much fun to kind of go around the horn with our classics too, because I don't drink oatmeal porter or black mocha stout very often, but when I do, I'm like, damn it, that's a great beer. And I'm so proud of it. And um, I haven't even tried all of our pilot brews because I can't drink that much. In the <laughs> we're releasing them every Friday. And, um, and it's so much fun to hear the staff talking about them and try, you know, I, I, sometimes I just have to get samplers, can't drink enough pints to keep up with everything. It's, it's wonderful, but you know, and I'm gathering information from our staff 
and our staff is very carefully monitoring what our guests are drinking and what they're saying. So it's, it's great to have this kind of constant buzz around our beers and, and I enjoy them so much. I, um, I'm really proud of our quality and consistency. So that's never going to go away. Um, I mean, inventiveness is like ramping up all the time. Yeah. And so we also have the question that ten, tends to be the hardest for uh -huh. folks to answer, uh -oh. which is, do you have a favorite beer or brewery other than your own? Other a than? Fa a favorite North Carolina beer or North Carolina brewery that you like when you're maybe not drinking college? Wow. Wow. Um, I will, you know, I've had several recently that I've enjoyed. Um, so uh, Sierra Nevada, I, kind of anything they make is going to be just on point. Um, I like the Sour Saison from New Belgium. I just had uh, Trophy Wife from Trophy Brewing, lovely. Um, and I don't get out as much as I'd like because I'm always here. Um, but there's so much great beer I know that's out there that I haven't even tried. Um, and, and just, you know, being in town, um, burial folks are doing a great job. And um, it's, it's really fun to get out and enjoy what other people are doing and, you know, seeing how they're contributing to a really cool industry. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about your vision for, for Highland for the next five years, but industry-wide, do you have uh, a picture of where you see the industry going in the wow. next five years? Yeah, it's a crazy time. When you right? back up five years, I don't know that people could have guessed where we were, would be today. Right. Yeah. I uh, wish I had the crystal ball. Um, I, I think there's some really critical things happening with distributors, retailers, and breweries. And so I think we have to be really careful about... Um, you know, breweries are opening. Pe consumers love to go to breweries. I'm. I love that. I'm, I'm banking on that. I'm investing in it. At the same time, having breweries all over the place can stretch some retailers that have been supporting those breweries. So I think we've got to be really careful about intentional about those relationships. That's why I've got one location and we're on this hilltop. Um, and you know, and people who are going to go about that different ways. Um, and I'm sure they've got benefits for, for you know, because everybody's careful about these relationships. The way that's going to work for us is going to have is to be this one place. Um, and then, you know, the, there's a lot of activity going on um, at the state level, which you know we are not really involved in that. Um, we've been with distributors since the first day, and we're past the self-distribution cap. And so, um, there are certain things I, I believe in, um, but don't really to get get too involved in I, I know it works for us so I'm just kind of you know staying in that lane um, and that there's a lot of passion and, and importance to people I like I love that it's important to people their businesses should be no matter where they stand on the industry um, and on on the rules so um, so that's complex but um, yeah I think the industry is going to change a lot we've already seen changes with significantly sized breweries struggling um, or changing hands uh, capital investment is changing the whole game, and um, you know we 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 are where we are because of really hard work and um, so, and some hard decisions here and there. I got ten times more ideas than I have money. That's not going to change. Um, so that's kind of the challenge, right? Is is how you continue to express the brands, which is really the people when you get behind it. Um, with the resources that you've got. So I look forward to that. I'm, I feel like we're in a great place and um, everybody's going to figure out different ways to do that. Yeah. And uh, when we were, when we did an interview with Sean last month, we were talking to him about Pop the Cap. Mm. And one Thank of the God things he mentioned, well, he, he laughed. He was like, we asked him how you found out about it and like, what was your first pop, post Pop the Cap beer? And he mentioned Highland. Oh, very cool. So, uh, that that was his place in in memory. So well, it's a, it's an interesting yeah tie. He in. was key to that happening too. Um, you know, I remember meeting him a long time because probably before I was with Highland, and I knew he was a leading voice in that effort. And I didn't know what it was. So I mean, we've come a long way, and and Sean's been a great leader 
Yeah, but that's obviously something that's had a massive impact on, you know, what you guys are producing. Yeah, I mean, it's so massive that I forget to talk about it because we wouldn't be where we, no one would be where we are. The state would be, would not be a beer state without Pop the Cap. So it it kind of happened before I got here. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the norm for me, but I forget that it was not, it was largely in our history, not the norm. We held ourselves back for a long time. Right. So, um... You kind of touched on this already, but when you're not here, <laughs> when you're not at the brewery, what do you what do you do for fun? What are your how do you enjoy Western North Carolina? Um, I love living here. This is this is such a great place to be. Um, but I yeah, it's really important to me to balance things out. So um, love being outside. Um, I love to I run a, a little bit, um, but biking, rollerblading. Believe it or not, I still have a pair. They're like cracking they're so old but if i can find a flat place to do that i love it um but getting outside and hiking is wonderful and so you know anything that tubing is that a sport i've done that sure not a sport not too many muscles involved in that outdoor activity it's certainly an activity it's an activity um but yeah i love being outside and i i to be active is that's what makes me enjoy the beer even more so that's that's why it's important to me to offer activities here and kind of have people be able to experience all that yeah. right at Highland. And you you actually mentioned this in passing a minute ago, but um, the race that you guys do, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the grueling race that we do <laughs> that I almost cry through every year. It's, <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, it's, it's a four and a half mile night race. So we start from the brewery at eight o'clock at night on a summer night and end up around here, do four and a half miles through the neighborhoods. People are wonderful. They come out of their houses and they do chalk paint on the sidewalks and they spray us with water and they cheer for us. It's the most fantastic thing. Beverly Hills rocks. <laughs> and uh, so then we come back here and we have a, a post party and we drink beer and we give out all the awards and we've raised $40,000 through four years of that race toward Greenway's efforts. And um, so that's delightful. It's people come out. I mean, it, it's just a great, great time I, I love what it is and I love what it does yeah that pretty much comes to the end of my questions is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to talk about in terms of Highland or, or your work here yeah did we miss uh, no, anything I think, they were, I think they were great questions um, I forgot to say that I like playing volleyball also I haven't done it in a while I used to be an, an addict I just need I'll, I'll admit it um, so we could build a court here one day but that's one of those like 10 times more ideas than money type thing. Would you be going with the beach court or? Oh a, yeah, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> and it would be done well, like adjustable net and you know, lines and the correct, correct everything, the right kind of sand so it drains. Um, so I think probably more people would enjoy trails. So we'll pr- probably do that first. Yeah. I'll, I'll be the court limits the number of people who can enjoy it at it one does. time. It does, especially when I play because I only want four people on the court. <laughs> So that's completely self-serving if I build that court. Uh, So we're going to put that off. (laughs) That sounds good. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. We really appreciate it.